There we go. Now we'll reshare my screen. Perfect. Work in progress. All right. So we're talking about calendar systems and tools for communication. And why we should create a schedule and for developing a routine of our day. Um, it's also for anticipa anticipation of what's going to happen, allowing our children the opportunity to anticipate what they're going to do next. Might be something really exciting for them that they're heading to, might be something that's not so exciting that they're heading to, but at least they know what's coming. Um, anticipation of what they're going to be experiencing. If we, for example, if you're going on a, you know, a trip in the car, sometimes when you get in the car with your child, they might be going to the park and that's a really great experience. And sometimes they might be going to the doctor and that's not so exciting for them. Uh, and so the reason that we create kind of a schedule system or a way to signal to them where they're going to be going reduces that anxiety of getting in the car every time. Because every time, if we're not sure if we're going to the park or if we're going to the doctors, every time our child gets in the car, that anxiety might build in them because they're not sure of where they're going. So it gives our child children a chance to anticipate what's coming next, because we all get that incidentally, and so they deserve that right to have that as well. Another thing is providing information in a mode that's accessible to the child. It's just, uh, you know, for some of our children who are deafblind, hearing might be reduced, they might not have access to the spoken language, um, they might be new sign learners, and parents or teachers might also be new at learning sign language. So this provides another way of presenting our children with information in a concrete mode that's accessible to them. It also provides a concrete label for the activity that the child can refer back to. Some of our children have difficulty with that short-term memory of remembering what's going to happen from point A to point B. If we present them with a symbol or an indication that we're going to take a bath and then mom gets called away to go do something, something happens with another child, and then we pick them up, and we've got to travel upstairs and get undressed. That, it, that a knowledge of what's coming and what's going to happen, our child might not be able to remember that for that consistent period of time. So providing with a concrete label that allows them to refer back to consistently during the process of from when you prompt them to let them know it's time to go take a bath to when you actually get in the bath. And it's something that for a language model that you can review again and again and again in that transition process. Hey, remember, we're going to take a bath. Here's your washcloth for going to take a bath. Remember, this is where we're headed to. And then when we get to the bath, providing them again with that label that this object matches with this activity. And then in the future, as our children become familiar with these concrete free objects, what they are and what they represent, it can be used as a communication tool. If it's accessible to them at alternative times, and not just when that activity is getting ready to happen, it may be an opportunity for your child to use that as a way to ask for that activity. If they're, if they're hungry or they're thirsty or they wanna play with their favorite toy, it can be a way for them to ask you for that. Could be a way for them to ask you when this is gonna happen. If they have a symbol for some of their favorite activities that they do throughout the day, might be a way for them to pull that out as if they're curious about when that's gonna happen. And that's a time that you can have your conversation with your child about that activity and when it's gonna take place. What should a schedule system look like for your child at home or even at school? Really at this point in time with whatever everybody's going with, it's whatever works best for your child, for the child and for your family. So it's as simple or as complex as you're able to make it. Really, if we give you something that's too complex and overwhelming to even know where to start, then it's not going to be something that you're going to be able to create or implement in your home. Um, so really, the best thing to do is start where you're at and where you are. Know that you are going to be able to implement whatever you create um, that works best for your family situation. Um, so that might be starting as simple as for our children who are, might have very complex needs. Um, and may have sleep schedules that are not routine or may spend a lot of their time lying on their back if they're not being held during the day. Uh, you know, a schedule could simply be as simple as using two different types of blankets with two different textures. 
And so in the morning when we wake up, we lay down on one type of blanket that might have uh, a more alerting texture or exciting texture for your child to maybe alert them to the day and get them engaged. And then in the afternoon, midday, late afternoon, we switch to another blanket with another texture that maybe is more soothing or more calming for them. Uh, and every day repeating that cycle so that they just have an idea of the progression of a day from morning to afternoon to then preparing for bedtime. Um, so it can be as simple as that to as complex as having multiple symbols, uh, picture symbols, whatever is accessible for you and your, you and your child. And so really what we're gonna do is kind of look at um, what some things could be. Uh, so for a hierarchy of where we would start with actually using some objects and creating a schedule for your child, really we wanna start with an identical object. The exact thing that your child is going to use or something that is identical to it. And so if while we're at home, this is gonna be a really, really easy process, hopefully, because these are objects that should be in your home because they're what your child is using currently for their routine activities. Their toothbrush, their washcloth, their spoon, their diaper, whatever it is that they use for that activity is gonna be the object that you present to them to represent that activity. So we wanna use the identical object. Um, and this can be developed in whatever systematic system works best for you and your family. Um, that might be as simple as before each activity, you go and you grab that object and bring it to your child and present it to your child, take it with them from where they are to the activity and use it right there in the activity. For example, if it's bath time, grabbing their washcloth or their rubber ducky that they have in the bath every night, bringing it to them, presenting it to them, telling that it's time to go take a bath, carrying that ducky with them from that point to the bathtub, reviewing it again when you get there, that it's time to take a bath, and then using that object in the bath with them through the experience. Um, and so we can start, or you can start with creating a basket, having some sort of like container or bin that you place the objects in so you have them in the location. Every time that you want to transition from an activity, you just grab your container. Um, so I kind of put together, I found a little plastic bin at the dollar store. Easy way to just put your materials in, throw them in, and then you've got one central location thing that you can carry around with you. Um, this might not be needed if you're in your home and you have everything very easily accessible. This might be good for professionals. If you're in school, when we get back in school, uh, is having a central location, something that's easy for you to carry around from place to place with your student. Put it on the back of their wheelchair, um, carry it over your arm, whatever is easiest to have it travel with you. And so then you can just take your real objects that you have that the child uses during that activity and carry them with you. It might be their plate for mealtime, could be their shoes getting dressed, could be their socks, whatever it is, diaper, favorite blanket, and it all just goes in a bin, and so then you have the things ready for you prior to the activity. And we start with presenting the child with the object right before we go to that activity, bringing it with us and immediately going to that activity, presenting it to them again when we get to that activity, and then using that object. Then when that activity is finished, we put it back into whatever container. If we have a finished box or it goes back in the bin that you carry your objects in, whatever is easiest just to represent that that, ob that that activity is done. And then we're gonna present them with the next activity. So whatever is easiest for you to be able to, to present that consistently. The goal we want is consistency. Children need to be have the opportunity to consistently experience these objects in, in relationship with these activities in order for them to associate them and be able to, to make sense of that this object that I'm seeing represents this activity that I am going to. And that might be a situation, you know, eventually that your child can then when you present them with the symbol for bath time that they then take themselves up to go get a bath or they start pulling at their clothes because they're ready to take their clothes off, or they get excited for something that they really is an activity that they really enjoy, or they become upset and anxious about an activity 
that's not pleasant to them, but still they have that awareness and that anticipation and they know when good things are going to happen and when bad things are going to happen. And they don't have that overall anxiety of, I don't know when something good or something bad is going to happen to me. Once your child understands an identical object, if you're interested in moving to something more complex than that, um, you can move to an, a partial or an associated object. So this might be not necessarily their exact shoe, but a different shoe. Like I have a small kind of toy baby shoe that, rep that looks like a shoe. It has all of the same characteristics, but it can be the exact shoe that the child uses and wears. Um, so we can have, and then we have some partial objects or an associated object. We can also, you can use them simply as objects themselves or you can start to mount them on something on a separate card. Um, this is where we can start to add some abstractness to it. So you can mount it on a card and this is, so this represents that we're going to the activity, but isn't gonna be the actual sock that we use and that your child puts on, it's going to represent that. Um, maybe a comb for brushing our hair. We can start cutting objects and using maybe a partial cup Maybe instead of using their cup, we can use half a cup that we mount that makes it a little bit easier to fit in smaller spaces. Um, so this is gonna definitely depend on your child's ability to understand more abstract reasoning uh, and be able to represent and show you that they understand what that thing is trying to represent. Um, this is also where if you're starting to get into some abstract activities, play time, um, if we're at school and it's circle time or certain activities that don't necessarily have a concrete symbol attached to them, where we might have to start getting more abstract and adding something that is an abstract symbol, but we're pairing it, it's that consistency, we pair the object with the language for it, we pair the object with the exact activity that we're heading to, and then over there, we consistently repeat that every day, every time we do that activity. And over time, we develop that, that understanding of what that object represents through that repetition. One thing, key thing to remember though, when we start using associated objects or partial objects um, is to remember that what our children experience in an activity. Um, for example, at school, if we're talking about the bus, to us, a miniature toy bus is a representation of a larger bus, but that's because that we have the visual image in our mind of what an entire bus looks like. Um, for our kids, that means that the ability that when we go outside of our house or outside of the school and we're staring at a bus, that means the ability of either to turn our head and scan an image, see the back of the bus, the middle of the bus, and the front of the bus and synthesize that image into one full image of what a bus looks like, or to be able to see it at a distance as a whole image is one bus. Um, both of those things can be very difficult for our kids to achieve. So keeping that in mind, it needs to be a representation. The objects that we use or the photos that we use need to be accessible for our kids and what their experience is during that activity or that routine. Um, they might not have the concept of a full bus because they never take in visually what a full bus looks like. Um, so their experience might be the straps on their wheelchair. Um, I've used before, one thing we use often is actually if you go to the, to the dollar store and find um, dog collars, it actually works that the clips on a collar, if you cut off the ends and maybe mount it, the clips on a collar are very similar to the clips that are on a, um, a vest or a wheelchair. Um, so that could be a symbol. Or if your child has a favorite toy that they take on the bus or in the car with them every time you go on a ride, that could be the object that they associate with traveling in the car or on the bus. Um, so we really need to think about what the child experiences during that activity because that's what they're going to relate to that experience or that routine. Um, we can move down to once the child understands a partial or associated object, you can also try photos. Photos is an option depending on the visual access that your child has to photographs. And photos are of course more concrete than picture symbols. 
our board maker symbols or more abstract drawings. Um, and then we move down to either print or braille, if that's where your child is at with on an abstract level. And spoken words or signs is the last thing that we would use to um, as a simple symbol without any other additional concrete information. And the reason for that is, is that spoken words and signs disappear. We say it and then it's gone. Or we sign it and then it's gone. So we don't have that concrete thing to refer back to, to go, oh wait, where am I going again? Am I going to take a bath? Am I going to music class? Am I going to art class? Where are we going again? So those, that's the last thing that we use independently. We always use language, be it spoken words, signs, however it is, in conjunction with our concrete objects because we want to pair that and we want to provide our children with that exposure to spoken language or sign language uh, or the label for the activity of where they are going to because that is our hope that eventually they will be able to use a more abstract system for communication. But initially, definitely it needs to be paired with something concrete that they can keep with them and refer back to and is accessible to them on their developmental level and their language level for understanding. So our most basic thing as we were talking about is it is an anticipation calendar. And that is simply presenting one object or one item before the act, right before the activity happens, taking it to that activity, and then putting it in some sort of basket or doing something with it when it's done to signify that it is done. And then we hand you the activity, uh, the symbol for the next activity. Um, for parents at home, this can be as few items or as many items as you can manage. Um, maybe we start with just the most routine things that you do every single day, maybe teeth brushing, bathing, diapering, feeding, and maybe that's where you stop. Um, but maybe you start picking on some other activities that you're now doing at home or things that you do in school if you're a professional, start working on some you know, additional activities. Um, we really start with those ones that are presented over and over again uh, during routine activities that can help with your consistency in presenting them and your child's consistency in recognizing them and matching them to the activity. Um, so you start with as few or as little as you need. And then we move to more of a maybe first then type of thing. You know, first we can go to, we're going to take a bath and then we're going to get to go play outside. Which might not be the order that those two should happen in, um, but maybe we're going to have breakfast first and then we're going to go play outside. Um, so then you can start talking about a first then kind of thing of first we're going to do this and then we're going to get to do that. So if we actually are showing them something that might not be as motivating or as an exciting of an activity, we can pair it then with, then we're gonna to get to go do something that might be more exciting for them. Um, okay. And when we're doing these initial introductory things, as we said, with one object, the order that we do it in is we present them with the object or whatever the activity is. We bring our child, our, you know, wherever they are, in the home, if they're in a chair, if they're in front of the TV, if they're lying on their back, wherever they are, um, bring the item to them. If it's time to change our diaper, we're gonna bring them the symbol. We're gonna pair it with that language, show it with the, to them, pair it with language in whatever form that we're giving that to them, spoken language, sign language, however that is. Um, and this includes some wait time though, because a lot of times our kids can't handle multiple modalities at the same time. So we're likely going to present them with the object, give them an opportunity to explore it tactually, maybe visually if they have access to it. Then we're going to pair it with that language. And then within 30 seconds, so immediately following however long that takes, we're going to go to that activity. We're going to do that thing. We're going to change the diaper. And we're going to refer to it again if it's something that we need to go to to get to, we need to go to the changing table or somewhere where we're gonna change the diaper. When we get there, we again refer to that again, let them know that it's time to change their diaper. And then when we're done, we're gonna place it in a finished box. Um, 
if it's something like changing a diaper, if you use this actual diaper to uh, as your symbol, maybe then you take a new one and put it in the finished box for next time, or you could save this one just as your symbol all the way through and use a separate diaper uh, to actually change your child. So if we master that and we're looking to get more complex for our children and start creating an order of their day, um, you can get as simple or as complex as you need. So we can start with, um, if you're at home, I found at the dollar store also, it's a little like three tray bin. It's got three different sections in it. And that can be what you put your objects into. Your little shoe, our diaper, and our sock. You know, and then we start working on maybe three objects. And first we're going to put our shoes, well this would be a terrible order of items if we're putting our shoes on before our socks. But let's say that we're going to put our diaper on and then we're gonna put our clothes on and then we're gonna go eat breakfast, have a meal. And so you can start working on a succession of three objects at a time and moving from first to next to last and then build it again with three more objects. Um, and so you can start with two, working on first then, and then switch out your objects every two. You can start with three, or we can build to a set like you're seeing here in some of these pictures um, that we're going through. This might be that child's entire day at school or at home um, and setting out the, all the items that they're gonna do through that day. So one of your eventual goals can be, either at home or at school, is setting up a system like this that covers your child's entire day and starting in the morning and setting this up with them. Talking about today, hey, today is Tuesday. What do we do on Tuesday? Um, if it's in school, this might be a lot easier of a routine to do because you might have the same schedule or the same activities every Tuesday. Um, at home, this might be a little different but it could be an opportunity to have that conversation with your child about, hey, we're at home and it's Tuesday, what do we want to do today? Here's your list of objects that you have to choose from, your list of activities that you have to choose from. What do you want to do today? Um, so it can equally be used as an opportunity to have a conversation with your child or to demonstrate that they are learning that routine and that system of the day that if they're in school on every Tuesday, we go to gym, so we need to put gym in there, or the having the items and being able to order them correctly based on what they do throughout that day. Uh, so these calendar systems can be used for a multitude of activities, ways to inform your child, ways to have a conversation with children over these objects, um, and then to even expand beyond this and create schedule systems within activities if you really want to get complex. Uh, you know, having saying that the toothbrush there, that it's time to go brush your teeth, and then having a separate kind of list of activities that you do within that teeth brushing routine to help increase that independence of your child. Um, so it really can be used in a variety of ways, not only for information, but also for communication. And so as we discussed, we can go from more concrete. We are always going to want to start with the most concrete and make sure that our children are aware of that and understand what that symbol represents. And then we can start moving to more abstract object symbols. Um, and so these are some that are mounted. So this is something that you, again, could put into some sort of bin or container, just throw together, um, maybe in a binder. Collect them if you're able to mount them like this and use some smaller materials. You could put them in a binder and carry that binder with you. So you have um, something on the front where you put the one symbol for the activity that you're going to next, and then everything else is stored in that binder for you. So when you finish that activity, you're ready with the symbol for the next activity to put it on the front of the binder, and off we go. Um, so really, it's all about creativity and what is going to work best for you and your child or your student in the situation that you're in to have these accessible to you. And for some kids, they might be able to access picture symbols. This will definitely depend on your student or your child's vision, visual access to these materials. Uh, also, their ability to understand more abstract symbols and what these represent. 
but you can see that people have gotten creative. It can be, you know, you can start even then if we want to take the symbols or pictures and creating a more concrete schedule system. They can be, you know, mounted in some sort of tray where you put objects, could be created in some sort of um, strip that you put on a wall or on a table where things are Velcroed on or mounted in some way to have some sort of, to actually create like a schedule, schedule strip. Uh, and a lot of these things that are mounted often are, you know, at least for the ones that I have used too, is just black chipboard. And so this chipboard can be purchased on Amazon. Um, it's called chipboard, C-H-I-P-B-O-A-R-D. Chipboard is um, what it's called. And so easy to cut, It's but it's pretty sturdy to use for mounting objects. Um, so it's not going to tear as easily as construction paper or something more flimsy. So you could use that as your thing to mount your objects onto, uh, or use that as your device to mount your whole schedule onto, as you see here in this picture. Really the goal when we start creating these systems and a more complex system like this is to figure out ways to have it be accessible to the child at all times. That's really what we want, is that our kids can not only use these objects when they are preparing for a transition or preparing to go to a next activity, but also use them at other times to as a communication tool or a way to refer back to what's next on my schedule. When do I get to go do my favorite activity? What are we going to do next? Um, or, hey, I'd like to move things around on my schedule because I really prefer to go outside as opposed to clean my room. Um, so it can become a conversation tool or a thing that they use to request what their favorite activity is or request what they'd like to do for that day. Um, so finding ways to have it accessible to your child at all times so that they can utilize it as a tool for, as a schedule system, um, but also to be able to manipulate it and interact with it and refer back to it. Because if we only see these items in the moment when they are presented to us, it's harder to then create that memory um, use that repetition to learn what that symbol means, learn what the label is for it and for the activity that it represents. Jen, hmm? there is a question, is chipboard similar to foam board? Um, yeah, it's kind of the same thing. There's the like foam board that you get, I don't, is it called foam board or the, um, Becky, what is that, the, what, is, what is this stuff that you get from like Michaels or AC Moore that's kind of three ply, the plastic um, that's really like a plastic canvas you know maybe this is more the foam board um, that they were using at that school in Howard County I, know I, can't, I, I can't really see it they can um, but yes it is kind of the same thing it's just any it's just not it's not as flexible it's more like really thick uh, cardboard so it's it's harder to to bend and flex so it's harder to destroy but yes it is kind of the same thing this is more of an Amazon or Joann's kind of purchase and I think the foam board that you're talking about is more of maybe like a, a Michael's store purchase easier to access um, Sue mentioned that is it could it be corrugated plastic yes thank you that's what it is that's what it's called thank you Sue thank you Sue Yes, corrugated plastic is another tool that you can use too. Yep, um, corrugated plastic, I found it's a little harder to cut. You more maybe need an X-Acto knife um, or some better scissors to not get some sharp edges. So chipboard I had found you can get in larger quantities, like a pack of 12, um, and it kind of cuts pretty easy with a pair of scissors or a, uh, a paper cutter. Um, so it's really kind of whatever suits your needs and is easier for you to access. Thank you guys. So as we've been talking about is when we're choosing our items or we're choosing whether or not we use uh, objects versus partial objects versus pictures, really it comes down to how much does your child or your student have access to symbolism? Do they understand that the symbol or the item that you are choosing matches the referent or the activity which you are headed to? Um, and this is what kind of what we talked about with the bus. Do, does your child, if you present them with a miniature toy bus, 
have that symbolism to understand that that represents that giant vehicle that sits in front of them every day when they leave the school. Um, and so a kind of a way to test this is before you use it as an object for a schedule system, allow your child to explore these items, play with these items. If, for example, it's going to be a water bottle and you give them um, a water bottle, a bottle of water with the cap off, will they try and put the cap on the water bottle? Can they match um, a cap, a blank, you know, a single cap like that? Can they match that to a bottle of water that has the cap on it to kind of show that they understand that these things go together? If you give them a cap, can they go to the kitchen? Will they shift their gaze and look at your water bottle that's sitting on the table? Just kind of playing with that and, and engaging in those experiences to find ways to check and see does your child understand that this object or this thing represent this reference that you're trying to refer to and to match it with? Um, and if they don't, then we need to kind of move back and start at a more concrete foundation. So we might not be able to use just the cap of the water bottle. We might have to actually use the whole water bottle. Um, maybe we can use an empty one. Use an empty one. Um, or maybe we actually have to use the full bottle of water that they are going to actually open and drink. Also, we need to think about the relationship that your child has between the object and the image or the symbol that they're using. So for example, if your child only ever experiences a banana as slices of a banana that, that are presented on their tray for them to eat, they might not make that association that those slices of banana are the same thing as that whole banana or as that picture of a banana or as that picture of a bunch of bananas. Um, so really being aware of what our child's relationship is with that object or that photo, uh, what their experiences is, what their experience is in that activity that we are trying to refer to. Uh, for example, if, you know, if your child, when they have cereal, if they only ever get the cereal in the bowl, maybe using a picture of the box of the cereal is not a great way to represent that activity because that might not be something that they ref that they associate with their bowl of cereal. Um, if we so when we talk about food and and objects or pictures when we're looking at this slide, one thing that we can do with these is use it as a communication tool and maybe create a um, picture board of various foods that is your child's favorite foods to use as a choice making board. Um, so our objects or our symbols can then become communication in choice making options. This can be pictures of their favorite foods and you can make them into magnets and magnet put them on the refrigerator so when they're hungry or it's time to eat, you can bring your child over and have them choose from the list of images on the refrigerator what food they'd like to have. Um, and that can be done in a variety of forms. That can be done in objects for playtime. If it's, you know, if that's when they have the most opportunity to make a choice, we can use objects. You can use the actual objects again. You can use symbols that represent the objects and create them some sort of choice board that during that free play time, they have the opportunity to choose between what toys that they want to play with. Um, and that might be from a selection of two to a selection of 10. It's really whatever you have the capacity to make and what your child has the capacity to take in at that time. So we don't have to start with the whole world. We can start small and build. And so here's some option ideas and some examples of some choice boards. So as you see in the bottom left, it can be done with objects and symbols, or it can be done with photographs or abstract images if that's where your child is at. Um, the one on the bottom picture on the right was found, somebody found using old CD cases and put some flat objects that they had found in old CD cases and match them to an abstract image because they're trying to teach the child the association between the object and the abstract image. Um, so it can be done in a variety of different formats. 
just always remembering that it might not be what is easiest for us, but we need to really think about what is going to be accessible for our child or our student, where they are at in regards to their language foundation and their need for concrete materials. And so a good tool just to have in your toolbox as a parent or a professional um, is this likes and dislikes form. And the link to finding this on the, this is from the Washington State DeafBlind project, uh, has this on their website. And so the link is at the bottom there. You just click on the DeafBlind tab and you can um, pull this up and print it out, use it on your computer, however is accessible. So this is the likes one and then you'll see the dislikes one looks exactly the same. Um, but that's for dislikes. And so this is a really good tool to use while you guys are off and have your children at home, print this out, start making a list of what their favorite things are. What are their likes and their favorite people, their favorite toys, their favorite activities, um, and what are their dislikes? And so that might be what you start once you kind of create this list of, all right, what are my child's favorite things? These are the things that we want to create some symbols for first, if we're looking to do this for communication purposes. So picking those objects or those symbols that we use to represent those toys, that their favorite things, their favorite people, their favorite activities, um, and using those as options to choose from. Because our things that are most preferred by our children are going to be what they want to communicate about most. Um, if it's something that's motivating to them, they're going to be more likely to communicate and want to request it than if it's something that just, meh, I don't really care about that. Uh, so we want to kind of make a list of what are these things that our children like the best and it might not always be objects. So finding either as a, you know, a photograph or some sort of tactile representation to sit to uh, represent that activity or that person or that place that they like best and using those as choice making tools for communication. And then this is something that you can send with your child when they go back to school and show their team at school. This is my child's favorite, you know, this is all my child's likes. This is what's most motivating to them. And these are their dislikes. These are the things that maybe we want to um, avoid or that we want to pair and see, used it as a test to see, do they understand the symbols we're presenting to them because they're going to choose the thing that they like or do they choose the thing that they dislike because they maybe don't necessarily understand what that symbol represents. Um, so it's a way to kind of test our comprehension of our symbols too. Uh, but this is a really good tool to have to figure out where to start with your objects based on what's most motivating to your children. And might be something that you send with them when you, you know, if you create a list of their likes and then you create some symbols to represent to as to use as um, choice making tools for their what their most motivating things are, then when they go back to school, send those with your child, have them use them in school have them being able to, to communicate in a variety of different situations using their most motivating things. And so just when we're talking about how do we build expressive language, we don't want to limit what we expose them to, but we want to make it accessible to our kids. And if we want them to use a certain modality expressively, be that an AAC device, be that objects, be that symbols, be that photos, um, they need to see others modeling that modality as well. So really using that as a way that we express things to them and not just require them to express things to us. Um, and just isolating those key terms when we provide them with the, the tactile symbol to represent the activity, isolating those key words, those key phrases that we are looking for them to be able to learn through language and hopefully in time, give back to us expressively. We talked about motivation, determining motivation, using the likes dislikes form. Um, and during this time, while you guys are home with your children and you have the, the time to spend with them, to actively engage with them during an activity, or maybe just being with them in the moment, uh, it's the time that you can observe your child's actions during an activity. Create a fun activity, something, you know, tactile. It can be playing peekaboo or so big or just any sort of gestural movement related activity that your child can experience and participate in and then pausing for a minute and seeing what they do. Do they do anything that gives you the indication that they want to do more of that, that they liked it? 
um, smiling, moving their body, raising their arms, arcing their back because they want to be rocked again. So observing just your child's actions and seeing how they communicate to you that they either like something or dislike something, maybe you want more of that activity. Um, and if they don't give you anything, kind of giving them maybe just some sort of movement or gesture that you know is physically possible for your child to do in that moment. So for example, a lot of times when we start like rocking to kids back and forth, if you're able to like rock them or swing them, um, and that's a movement or an activity that they really like, you'll see kids kind of when you stop, they, they might arc their body. They might kind of throw their head back or arc their body because they want to recreate, they're trying to continue that movement or that action that you were doing with them. Um, and that sometimes becomes a problem because we don't want our kids constantly just throwing their body back. That's not going to be safe. Um, but it's a way that they're definitely letting us know, they're communicating to us that they want more of that activity. So then we can maybe try and shape that into having them just uh, touch your arm or do something or put their hands on their own body in some way that we model for them, that we know that they are physically capable of doing and trying to shape that into what they use to request more of that activity that's more safe or appropriate for them. Um, and then just doing that again and again and again, if it's something that they like, providing repeated opportunities for them to participate in that activity, and then use a gesture to request more. Jen? Mm -hmm. Could you please explain more about shaping responses? Okay. Um, so we're just, when we're talking about shaping responses, so it's really, it's, it's observing, it is, it's doing things. It's doing a variety of things with our kids, determining what they like and, and what they don't like. Um, is that a, a person or an activity? We'd like it to be, it's not always an object. Um, but lots of times, sometimes it's an, an action or a movement or a game that we do uh, that can be as simple as just something moving our body, can be swinging, rocking, um, bouncing on, some, on mom and dad's lap, and then ceasing that activity for a moment and observing what our child, what the child does and how they react um, to get our attention to let us know if it's something that they like, that they want more of that, that they want to do it again. Um, and then shape, you know, we want to, whatever they do is what we want to reinforce. And we want to keep that going because that is how they are communicating to us. And we, the, the goal really is to create, if you could have 10 or 15 ways that are abstract, you know, non-formal ways that your child lets you know that they want more of that activity, that is so much more beneficial than having one formal sign that they let you know that they want more of something um, or that's the only activity that they can ask about. So our goal really is to get a broad number of activities or things that our child likes and ways that they can request that they want more of something. Um, but we might have to shape that if it's not safe or it's um, you know, we're working to, they're, they're getting it consistently and they're consistently doing whatever it is that they do and we want to move it slowly to something that's more concrete or that's more going to be familiar to others that they interact with. Um, but it really starts from what our child, reinforcing what the child does. So as a follow-up, it says we aren't trying to have them change their response. We are just trying, we are responding to their natural response. Yes. Yes, we are responding initially to their natural response. Um, I mean, the goal is eventually to possibly shape that into something that is could be recognized by a greater group of people outside when they when the child goes to school. But you can also, if, if your child does something, if they have very limited movement um, or very limited control of their body, whatever it is that they do, we now have so much access to technology and resources that you can create you know, a book of photos of how your child responds or, or lets you know that they want that activity. Um, you can create videos and set up a Google Drive for the whole team of the, that child works with to know what that action, to be able to take a video of you doing that with your child and show that to them of this is what my child likes to do and this is how they respond and tell me that they want more in that activity. Uh, so it doesn't have to be us forming them into something 
transforming their, their hands or their body into something that we want them to do to let us know. It can be how they respond. Um, but we don't want things that are unsafe um, or we don't want everything to be crying. We would try to get away from that. So that might be the moment that we start shaping our child's action into something else that we know that they physically can do, but that might be more appropriate. Um, and so then the follow-up to that is what are any ideas for shaping the response into something more universally recognizable or safer? So when something is abstract, how do you, how can we, what ideas do you have for making it more universal? That is really, I mean, the, the struggle with that is it's, it's independent to the child um, and oftentimes to what their abilities are and their mobility is. Um, so it, it totally depends on what, it, it's really knowing that child, knowing what their physical capabilities are, are and staying within that realm of something that they're going to be able to do. Because the problem is why we often see kids backtrack to behaviors um, maybe self-injurious behaviors or things that they have that they're using to get somebody's attention um, is because it's the easiest it's their easiest form of getting the attention oh if I do this thing I get reacted to really quickly you know if I if I some way start to maybe injure myself people react really quickly and I get what I want or I get my needs met but wait, if I have to actually like form a formal sign or do a gesture or an action or something in order to get what I want, that's gonna be more difficult, take more processing and more time. So they're not going to, to follow, it's gonna be more difficult to get them to follow through on that repeatedly. Um, so it's picking something that is safe and is doable, um, but sticks within that realm of what that child is physically able to do. And maybe that is if we're talking about the sign more, maybe they can bring their hands to midline and put them together, but can't necessarily form them in this specific sign. Maybe they can get it in a location or an area of the body that's similar to a more formal gesture or gives a recognition of more what they're requesting or what they want, but might not be a formal sign. And that's those moments that we just share with the team. Hey, this is what this child uses to let you know that this is what they're asking for. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and like we said, it's better to have 10 random gestures or modified signs than one formal sign. And getting creative in ways that we share this with the team and the people that work with the child. Cool. And do we have other questions? So quick. Oh, sorry. Oh, I mean, that yep. question might be just easier to say than, yep. than to type out. Um, so I am a parent and an SLP. Um, and so my question is actually kind of big and also very highly personal. Um, my daughter, she's three and a half. Um, she's very complex. She, um, and she has visual impairment that's progressive. And um, when you were talking about coming up with these tactile or object symbols for highly motivating things, um, I'm thinking about a conversation I'm currently having with uh, my daughter's school team about core words versus what they call fringe words, which are those very highly spe specific um, items, highly motivating items. And um, I feel that she is in this pre, um, abstract stage of development and um just to give like they sent home this <laughs> recently with 27 <laughs> different symbols um to help facilitate communication at home so again very both a really big question and also a highly personal question um but i'm wondering what questions would you recommend starting with in my conversations with her team and any type of resources to help educate myself better with having that conversation. Okay, if she's at this concrete stage where she's not, where we're not sure if she's even, what type of abstract symbols, language she's even accessing at this point and bridging it to this sort of um, mm -hmm. system that was sent home. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it absolutely okay. makes sense. Okay. Um, and that is, an, that is a perfect question because uh, we could really have a whole other webinar to talk about <laughs> this. 
the thing that you really want to start with to bring up to your team is the communication matrix. Are you familiar I with it last night? <laughs> yes. The communication <laughs> matrix um, is going to be your best tool. It can be completed. There is a parent version. It can be completed as a parent. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can take it to the team as well. But that's going to show really the level, the, con the foundational level that your child is at communicatively and so thereby give them the idea of where they need to start with foundational communication for her. Um, that she's just not ready to access those abstract symbols in any shape or form. No. And especially if she has progressive vision, why are we going to start with something that's abstract visually? Right. We want right. to go to tactile materials that she's going to be able to understand both now and as her, as her vision progresses. Right. Yeah. Right. Thank, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so my email address, my email is right here on the, the slide. Uh, feel free to write it down if anybody has additional questions, wants additional resources at any point. Um, I am going to put up, I don't know if it's coming up in one poll or two, but um, I'm going to do a little evaluation. We also need to, as a grant, evaluate what we're doing and if it's relevant to people and helpful or not. Um, so I'm going to try and this is my first time using polls, so we'll see how this goes, but I'm going to put up this poll and I think this one is only, okay, this, so this one is three questions and maybe there is a second one. I'm not sure how that, <laughs> maybe there is, maybe there isn't. We'll, we'll just go with these three questions, but if you're able to, um, kind of complete the poll, it's, it's anonymous. Um, be really helpful for us to collect this data of to know what people are looking for and if it's helpful or how we expand on this and provide more to you guys. And at the same time, if people are still thinking and have other questions, um, feel free to chime in. So um, somebody said that they can't see the poll. If you look oh. at the bottom of your screen, um, you might have to kind of click in the gray. The, you should have a toolbar that comes up and right in the, um, towards the left is one that says polls. Well, darn, oh, okay, I'm sharing. And maybe, maybe I need to shop, stop sharing my screen. Maybe that would help it also be visible. Try bringing your cursor all the way down to the bottom or maybe to the top if your taskbar is at the top and you should be able to find some icons, hopefully. Lots of people don't have it, Jen. Well, darn. Yeah, it's at the bottom of the, so I guess I can't, I guess it's not showing to you guys unless you click on the actual Polls. Yeah, I did. I just thought I enabled it for this meeting. Um, are people that are able to find the polls button at the bottom of the page, are they still not seeing it or is it just we're not finding the polls button? I'm listening to it on my phone and I can't find it anywhere. Hmm. Right. I'm seeing it, um, Jen, and it says launch polling, but then it says failed to launch polling error. Huh. Well, that's great. I mean, it says my pr presentation evaluation is in progress because I launched it, but nobody has voted, so nobody is seeing it. Um, alrighty then. Well, our other option too is um, I'm going to stop recording at the moment.